The following episode of The Kingdom of Isolation contains footage from the film being discussed. The footage is used solely for the purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support the animators by watching this film on Disney Plus or home media where available. This episode also contains spoilers throughout. Done and branded as garbage. Never to be watched again. Chicken Little, done and burning in hell, never to be spoken of again. Just got two more films in this era before we get back on track with films I actually want to talk about. Hopefully this and Bolt are not better than garbage of the films I've already mentioned. <sighs> Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Let's get started. Hello, my fellow Disney fans, and welcome to the latest episode of The Kingdom of Isolation. In times of trouble, why not celebrate the magic of Disney? And today, we are going to be looking at Meet the Robinsons, uh, released in 2007. The first film to be released under the banner of Walt Disney Animation Studios. <clears throat> this is also the last film to be distributed under the brand name Buena Vista, which had been used since 1955 with Baby Tramp. From Bolt and Wally onwards, every film made by Disney or any of their subsidiaries, be it Marvel, Lucasfilm, Touchstone, etc., would be distributed under Walt Disney Motion Pictures. Now, the subject of today's film, Meet the Robinsons, is based on the children's book, A Day with Wilbur Robinson by William Joyce, which was published in 1990. I've neither read the book or seen the film, so I'm going in completely blind with this. This bought the 2011 Winnie the Pooh film and Strange World are the only films from the animat animated classics list that I haven't watched yet. So once they've been watched, as well as Wish, coming on November 22nd, 2023 here in the UK, meaning I have about a month to complete this list before Wish comes out to get through the remaining 15 films. <laughs> A film every two days on average. Um, sounds doable. Anyway. The goal at the end of the day is still to get every animated classic done before the end of the year. So, anyway, let's get cracking. <laughs> Ah, hello, Steamboat Willie. Good to see you in the public domain soon. Which will give us a horror movie about Mickey Mouse. No! Anyway, we also see the new Walt Disney Pictures intro for the first time. Don't worry, I'll still be using the classic intro we all know and love from our childhoods. Lewis gets dropped off at the orphanage, and the monochrome-esque opening is a great stylistic choice for the opening scene. Fast forward some time later, and we see Lewis and his friend trying to make something. Lewis is voiced by two actors here, Daniel Hansen and Jordan Fry, with lo long-time animator Nick Ranieri as supervising animator of the character. Side, side note, that baseball kid, can he stop talking for a moment, please? I love baseball. It's my destiny to play that game. I don't really care about winning. Well, like, now I do, because, like, we've lost every game. I've gotten tired of it. He's already annoying me with his monotone voice. Anyway, the reason for two different voice actors is because the original actor's voice broke during production, resulting in the recasting. Disney clearly learned nothing from the Jungle Book or Sword in this film because the same issue happened there as well, where the voice broke during production, but never got recast. 
the voice change is noticeable in some areas, which is quite jarring when you cast pre-adolescent kids in leading voice acting roles. Freddie Highmore, Josh Hutchinson, Michael Cera, and Moises Arias were all considered for the role of Lewis before we got the name Cap. And Huh? Goob! Hey, I did a goob! I finished it! They're gonna love this! I was like, Goob? That's the best name you could come up with for that monotone kid? Wait, what? Oh, that's his nickname! Got it. His, his real name is Michael Yagubian? I think that's how it's pronounced. He's voiced by Michael uh, Jostin. I think refer I think referring to him, I think referring to him as Goob, no matter how much I don't like it, makes it easier in some areas. But we have it actually. We have an actually first name we use from here on out. Uh, the film's director, Stephen J. Anderson, was an adopted child himself and lobbied to direct the film as he personally experienced many of the emotions Lewis expresses throughout the film. Now that's a passion project. Mildred, voiced by Angela Bassett with Ruben A. Aquino as supervising animator, hopes Lewis gets adopted today. Now, Angela Bassett has a lot of roles to her name. So I'll just rattle a few off. <clears throat> Kindergarten Cop, Boys in the Hood, Malcolm X, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Green Lantern, Olympus and London has Olympus has fallen and London has fallen, Bumblebee, Black Panther, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, the Mission Impossible Fallout, and Avengers Endgame. Oh, and um, Soul, uh, Soul as well as those are just some of her uh, film roles. Her TV appearances include Alias, ER. Simpsons, because of course, who has no field in the Simpsons at some point. Uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, and her best known role is in 911. I mean, there's so many things in the world that can be improved. Just think of it moving sidewalks, flying cars. Flying cars? Ah, uh, yes, flying cars. By the way, back to the future. We're still waiting! So, as to be expected, it all goes south. Quickly, his PBJ machine causes a village reaction, and he doesn't get adopted, and he's really downbeat about it. It's not you. We just haven't found the right couple yet. 124. Sorry, wait, what? 100, sorry, wait, what? 142? Yes. 124. And he still hasn't been adopted yet? Is it just because he invents things that makes it different from everyone else and these stereotypical parents just want a normal kid? <sighs> but mind you, 124 interviews is a bit much, if, a bit much if you ask me. And he's going to be a teenager soon, so not looking good at the moment. Montage time, and I'm not a fan of the song. Lewis is eager to find his mother, if he can remember her, and starts inventing something else. Get something for a science fair to showcase what to do. Mildred has scheduled an interview for Lewis, who's heading to the science fair. Mildred shows concern that he's stuck in the past rather than looking to the future. The school the science fair takes place in is at Joyce Williams Elementary, which is a nod to William Joyce, the author of the book. Lucille Crunklehorn and Mr. Williston are helping to run the fair today, and the energy is not gelling with me. Anyway, Williston's voiced by Tom Kenny, who's best known for Spongebob, alongside many other Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon shows from the 90s and 2000s. If I went through the entire list, I'd be here all day. <laughs> Lloyd Metcalf, on the other hand, was last seen in the Kingdom of Isolation as Jim's mother in Treasure Planet, episode in the top right of the screens. And oh my god! Need that many caffeine patches! The coach is a bit off, if you ask me. Why? That's why. 
What's with his legs? Never skip leg day, folks. Lewis demonstrates how his memory scanner works. And then the bowler hat guy, voiced by the director of the film, decides to let his bowler hat tamper with Lewis's memory scanner. By the way, why does that fire ant kid look like Wednesday Adams? Scanner falls apart, the volcano experiment goes kaboom, the fire ants swarm the coach, and all hell breaks loose. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <sighs> Not now. <laughs> yeah, thanks for making Lewis feel even more miserable than he already is. Also, what's with this grayed out color scheme that was used to death in the mid 2000s? Even video games like Gears of War used this. So the bowler hat guy decides to steal Lewis's memory scanner to try and pass off as his own, which doesn't end well because it's never worked for him in the past. What makes him think it'll work this time? Ah. Damn, I miss these sort of villains. Just evil right out the gate for no, for, with no reason to be good. Will, because Wilder, meanwhile, he's not done trying to convince Lewis that he's from the future. And he's now more annoying. And he's now more annoying than that monotone goob. Because Wilbur just will not shut up. And... What is this? Where are we going? To the future! Huh? And... And you miss the one opportunity you had to say back to the future. Oh boy. So apparently the future has arrived. You know, some title says it all. Without flying cars, which we're still waiting on. I'll give it this though. It looks much better than the one who won't be named. Up next, <laughs> Chicken Little. Say that name one more time and I'll send you back to the future. We get, ref we get references to Tomorrowland in the form of Todayland as we see people traveling around in bubbles. Say what? Hey, I'm not going to fix that stupid memory scanner. <laughs> what? So, so, say what? Wilbur, this is a time machine. Why should I fix my dumb invention when you can take me to see my mom now? Lewis, I am just going to point you to this scene in Back to the Future 2. The encounter could create a time paradox, the results of which could cause a chain reaction that would unravel the very fabric of the space-time continuum and destroy the entire universe. <sighs> Granted, that's a worst-case scenario. That's why you don't change the past. Because worst case scenario, everything falls apart. <laughs> Lewis then breaks the machine, and yet Wilbur says, I am so dead. Why? There's only two time machines in existence, and the bowler hat guy has the other one. Oh, that's one. Strike one for plot convenience. Of course the bad guy has the other one. Lewis agrees. Lewis agrees to fix the machine if Wilbur takes him to see his mother, which is followed up by Wilbur reminding Lewis that he didn't follow up on the last deal of going back to the science fair. Spoiler alert, a bit like going back there now. <laughs> yeah, Wilbur doesn't understand sarcasm, apparently. All right, we'll call it a draw. We mirror fade back to present day and we see the baller hat guy try and steal someone else's appointment. Very unconvincing. Any normal person would kick this guy out on the spot after that. The funny part here is that his folder has a unicorn as the cover. Definitely didn't expect that from the villain. <laughs> I mean, if you have the closed captions on when you're watching this film, or the subtitles as the simpletons call it, the bowler hat is called Doris, who is voiced by Ethan Sandler. Wait a minute. Oh, thank God they're not related. Oh, thank God they're not related. The fact Doris is being his teleprompter should immediately raise suspicion that he clearly isn't prepared for this. 
You have two minutes. Please begin. Two minutes. Bring it. So he tries to pitch his device, which he dem which he doesn't know the name of. Tries to demonstrate how it works, even though he hasn't got a clue what to do, and wasn't paying attention when Lewis did the demo earlier that very same day. And when time expires, he's kicked out of the building. Should have happened the moment he entered, claiming he was the two o'clock appointment. Doris convinces him to get the bleeping boy. Yes, he censored himself in writing form. Ah, oh, it's been way too long since I've used the Tamatella gag. Mom never goes in there, and Dad's on a business trip until tomorrow morning. Wait, what? Oh, oh, you, oh your dad's on a business trip? Watch him be there when they arrive. No? Oh. But seriously, honestly, how dumb can you possibly be? And my friend pointed... Uh, anyway, sorry, uh, my friend pointed out that the gold robot looks like the robot from Robots. How would my hair be a dead giveaway? That is an excellent question. Wait, where are you going? Another excellent question. Wilbur, just answer the questions. You dumbass! And it'd be one piece. Lewis manages to ring a doorbell that somehow delivers. Hey, ring my doorbell. No, 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 no. Ring my doorbell. Ring it, ring it, ring it, ring it. Look at this doorbell, ring it. Yes, I did put in the Final Fantasy fanfare over that part. This is what it actually sounds like. Wilbur then decides to become unlikable when he tells the robot he lied about taking Lewis to see his mother, just to buy him some time. Whenever someone says they have something under control, it's clear as day they don't have it under control. What? And I don't want to tell you, but I did. I won't exist. And where does that leave me? Alone, rusting in a corner. Oh good, maybe he'll learn something by not existing. <laughs> oh no, that got dark very quickly. This old man should not be able to speak as clearly as that without teeth. Also, that's not the garage, or garage as they call it in America. Ooh, two minutes! And I managed to get through almost an entire page of the script. Excellent! And uh, how much time did I cut? How much time does, uh, does that equate to in terms of how much I covered in the film? Ooh! Not bad for just summarizing it in two minutes. We get treated to an Adam West cameo. Wait, he's not a cameo? He's actually vo he's actually got a proper voice acting role here? Oh! Anyway, he voices a superhero ordering pizza. Wait, sorry. Oh, right. He's a, pizza, he's a pizza delivery guy. Got it. Wilbur's looking for Lewis, who's going anywhere that isn't the garage. Why is your dog wearing glasses? Oh, because his insurance won't pay for contacts. No, just, just, just no. That joke was so bad, you alone have just lost the character support on the scoreboard. We get introduced to Franny, voiced by Nicole Sullivan, with Randy Haycock as supervising animator. Franny, Franny's conducting a frog orchestra with a frog singing. Hmm. I guess that's one form of entertainment. Wilbur finally finds Lewis, quizzes him on what's happened after running into his family, and relief. No one's found out anything. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, Doris, fat guy, <laughs> makes it easier for now. <laughs> or should I say Doris, fat man? <laughs> oh, that's even funnier. Okay, we're going to go with Doris, fat man from now on. <laughs> uh... Decides to break into the orphanage to steal more of Lewis's ideas. Lewis is my stupid roommate. By the roof. He's always up there being dumb. Goob, why do you hate Lewis so much? Also, he's not dumb. Back in the future, meanwhile. Quick run through for from Wilbur on how his dad managed to keep moving forward. It becomes important later. Second working time machine. Kinda small. I'm assuming that's a joke. I'm ignoring it for time reasons. This and strike two this time for the innuendo. Doris Hatman decides to try and turn Lewis into, of all things, a duck. While a mini Doris, yes, that's a thing, infiltrates the house. Oh, calls the robot's name. <laughs> Makes things easier for me. He serves up dinner 
while Fawkes provides some dinner entertainment. Impressive, little sister. Your skills are strong, but not strong enough. Your words do not threaten me, brother. Then enough words. Now the real battle begins. Now, hang on. I'm sorry, but what's the joke supposed to be? The lips are not matching what's being said. What's the joke supposed to be here? Lewis tries to fix the PBJ machine, which doesn't work, and the family emphasize the theme of the film. Thanks, Quiet. Doris Hatman manages to bring. I'm a motherfucking T Rex! Yeah, thank you, Nostalgia Critic, from the past and cause havoc. Okay, everybody, this dino's deep dished. Ugh, Carl, you just can't keep your mouth shut, can you? I can't. Um, I mean, one thing I can't understand yet is why Doris Hatman is so obsessed with Lewis. And. <laughs> you brought the wrong dinosaur, you brought the wrong dinosaur. Ha ha, Doris Hatman, you brought the wrong dinosaur. Hey! <laughs> Mini Doris is captured, and Doris gives us some catharsis. Oh, that is so satisfying. Lewis gets adopted by the Robertsons, and we still have half an hour to go? Huh. Something's bad. Something bad's going to happen, isn't it? If I have to leave, can I at least go back and find my mom? Wilbur promised. You promised what? I was never going to do it, I swear. <gasps> oh... Oh, Wilbur, I officially hate you for what you just did. You're grounded till you die. Whoa. A bit extreme, but warranted. While I'm trying to process how much I hate Wilbur now, let's get some more behind the scenes stuff out of the way. Names considered for Wilbur include Toby Maguire, Shia LaBeouf, Michael Agarano. Zac Efron, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Toby was the first Spider-Man in the Sam Raimi tri trilogy. Shia was in Halls. Might cover that one in a future Kingdom of Isolation episode. Zach was, well, in High School Musical. Might also cover the trilogy at some point. Uh, and Joseph was... Joseph already has voice acting experience in Treasure Planet. Again, episode of the Drop by Drop the Screens. Lewis, I've already covered. Now, with Mildred, though, Oh boy. With Mildred, Rocio Banquels, Edina Menzel, Carmen Salinas, Christina Applegate, Bed Midler, Kathy Getty, Rachel McAdams, Niurka Marcos, Barbara Mori, and Elizabeth Perkins were all either considered or they had actually auditioned for the role before Bassett was cast. And Testament to how good uh, Angela Bassett's acting is. This moment from Black Panther Wakanda Forever pretty much speaks for itself. I am queen of the most powerful nation in the world, and my entire family is gone. Have I not given everything? I'm so glad she got nominated for Best Supporting Actress in that role. Uh, but hey, fair play to Jamie Lee Curtis at this year's Oscars. So... Doris Hatman, though. <clears throat> Big list incoming. Cue the Kirby music. <sighs> Will Ferrell, Alec Baldwin, Jeremy Piven, Johnny Knoxville, Ian McGregor, Steve Carell, Brian Cranston, Mike Myers, Gilbert Godfrey, Jason Statham, Jason Lee, Jerry Seinfeld, John Travolta, Bill Hader, Jason Hateman, uh, Jason Bateman, say, Will Nett, Ben Fraser, Steve Buscemi, Ben Stiller, Charles Sheen, Tom Green, Steve Zan, Will uh, Rupert Everett, Goran Viznich, Sam Rockwell, Dean Winter, Luke Wilson, Owen Wilson, Sasha Baron Cohen, Matthew Roderick, Julian McMahon, Daniel Craig, and Antonio Banderas. Yeah, that's a lot of names for just one character. No, that's a lot of damage! Hey, not now, Phil Swift. Lewis goes with Doris Hatman. <laughs> never get tired of <laughs> never get tired of saying that. And finds out. Are you saying that? I'm Wilbur's dad? Oh, give the boy a prize. What a twist. Son, sorry, he finds out. Son of a what? 
Lewis is Wilbur's father, and Doris Hatman wants to destroy him. <gasps> My old room. I think you mean our old room. What? Uh, yes, yes, it is I, Mike Yagubian! Wait, 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 I, I, what, I, why am I, why are we getting the second choice? I'm barely processing the first one! I knew I hated Goop for a reason. I know I said I was going to use Michael from uh, from the start, but oh my word. Goop just, ugh. Goop just somehow rolls off better. Turns out Doris Hat, turns out Doris Hatman, and I'm sad it's the last time I call him that, it is future Goop. Flashback time to the point the game was lost. And well, for some reason, no one wanted to adopt me. With all that anger over one baseball game, can't possibly imagine why. Sorry. I ended up in a position when I lost a championship after being obsessed with my rival. Starting to give myself that moment. Anyway, Goop blames Lewis, which, yeah, he has to take the blame on that one. And Wilbur has to take the blame for not listening when closing the door. Yeah, told you something bad was going to happen. The future changes and all hell breaks loose. Lewis manages to fix the time machine and now has to save the day. Goob walks away, full of regret. Cornelius sees his past self for the first time and encourages him to go back to the science fair. Wilbur, meanwhile, takes us back to the start of the film, upholds his part of the deal, and then takes Lewis back to the present day to go back to the science fair and helps Goob win the baseball game! Lewis gets back to the science fair and... A third twist? Are you kidding me? Unless you've been paying attention. Lewis gets adopted and... Oh. Oh, I'm a sucker for happy endings. We finish with this quote from Walt Disney himself. Around here, however, we don't look backwards for very long. We keep moving forward, opening up new doors and doing new things. And curiosity keeps leading us down the new paths. And uh, this genuinely did happen to me. But, oh, oh, how dare you recommend I watch Chicken Little again, Disney Plus? Burn the film! Burn the film in hell! It must never be seen again! So, on to the scores. Now, the story gets uh, a seven for me. It's uh, it's okay for the most part, but there's a couple of bits of plot convenience I'm just not really not really that big a fan of. Um, but that being said, though, it's a it, it's it's a good story. Uh, but I say there's just. There's just just a couple of issues that I just wasn't really a fan of. The characters would have got an eight, but oh, thanks to that. Um, uh, but oh, thanks to what Wilbur did. Oh, he just became very unlikable and he knocked it down to a seven. Thanks, Wilbur. You could have given this film 76%. Visuals get a seven. They're a vast improvement over uh, Chicken Little. But still, nothing about it really stands out apart, and especially the whole, uh, especially the whole grayed out stuff from the early two thousands. Just ugh. soundtrack gets an eight. I love, I, I I like the music that Danny Elfman, um, made for this film. But uh, even then, a couple of the songs I just wasn't really a fan of. And now into the legacy portion of the film. So, let's have a look. Reception. Here we go. 
67% on Rotten Tomatoes, which, yeah. Um, 67% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, it did okay at the box office, but, well, I say it did okay, but it, it was a box office disappointment. It's, uh, a budget of $150 million, and it only made 169.3 worldwide. So, yeah, it was a, it was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, despite all that, I, I, th I think it's okay. I think it's okay. Uh, Meet the Robbers, it was a video game um, published. Uh, they came out on PlayStation 2, 360, Wii, GameCube, DS, and um, a PC. Um, uh, it, the English-based the England-based Climax Group developed their own adaptation for the Game Boy Advance. Um, there was a cancelled sequel, uh, Meet Robinson's Two First Dates. Uh, that was what it was tentatively titled. Um, uh, but when John Lasseter became uh, the studio's new chief creative officer, he cancelled all sequels in development at Disney Toon including Meet Robinson's 2, and ordered the studio to shift its focus towards spin-off films and original productions. Probably for the best, because it meant we never had to worry about any direct to video sequels ever again. So that's why I'm calling that portion of the uh, uh, of Disney's history the Disney Toon Studios films. Now, a limited edition magic band was also released by the company to commemorate the film's 50th anniversary, uh, 15th anniversary. On May 7, 2022, crew, cast and crew who worked on the film, including Stephen Anderson, um, including Stephen Anderson, Jordan Fry, Matthew Joston, uh, Jesse Flower, uh, they all reunited to celebrate the film's 15th anniversary by partaking in a two-hour live stream on the Tammy Tucky Show on YouTube. Um, the event had been organized ahead of time. Now, in 2023, this, in 2023, the characters of Lewis Wilbur Bowler Hatsman, uh, Bowler Hat, sorry, Doris Hatsman, yeah, I got to say it, Carl and Lucille, in her young scientist judge form, appeared in Disney's centennial anniversary short film, Once Upon a Studio, in which they were recreated using the new CGI models. This was due to the original models not being animated for over a decade, as well as updates made to animation technology since the original film's release, with rigging and rendering being reworked so they could be used with modern technology. And for that, the legacy gets an 8. So we get an overall score of 74%. Now, we just need to see where that puts the film on the scoreboard. It's it's ahead of films like The Three Caballeros uh, and the rest of the packaging films. Apart from, oh, it's it's behind The Rescuers, but it is a, it's in between The Rescuers and The Three Caballeros. Now, that's slightly concerning, the fact that this is amongst the um, packaging of films, and the highest rated one being The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. So, yeah, it's a, it's a slight concern. It's a slight concern. But anyway. So, but yeah. It is a full, uh, how do we go about this? It's a full, it is a full 7,400 times better than Chicken Little ever will be. film does have its hits. It does have hits and misses. But that being said, though, it definitely drives home the idea that you should keep moving forward. And that's exactly what I'm going to do with the next episode where we cover Bolt. Also, thanks to Michael who helped with the thumbnails throughout the show's run. Now he's shown me how to do the thumbnails on my own. And now he's shown me how to do the thumbnails myself. It's time to test the cut of my sails and make them on my own. Word of advice, Michael, don't be a stranger. 
you're always welcome here. Same goes for everyone I've worked with in the past. You're more than welcome to visit anytime. Just drop me a message and we'll sort of it out. That being said, hope you enjoyed this episode of Kingdom of Isolation. If you did, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be part of the Kingdom of Isolation yourself, you can hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell, turn on notifications so you don't miss when an episode goes live. But like I say, the next episode is going to involve Vault. But until then, folks, we'll see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation.